I just completed a show with Dr. Mary Graybar and Jared Stepman. Both have written excellent books on uh, the distortions in American history. And as you know, we're in the middle of a crisis time that I think is largely a product of a battle of ideas. And unfortunately, I think the battle of ideas that support the Constitution, the founding of the country, the Declaration, and the essential freedoms that Americans have enjoyed for over 250 years are in jeopardy. And they're in jeopardy because of the ideas that are being taught by historians and the universities and the elementary schools, public schools. And a lot of these ideas can be laid at the foot of one person, in my view, a very bad guy, Howard Zinn, who wrote The History of the American People, which is filled with distortions. So join me as I learn more about Howard Zinn's book and the resulting uh, influence he's had and the impact on our culture today and, and hopefully some of the things we might do about it. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists, and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics, and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show. Uh, an existential question is now dividing America. Uh, is the essence of our civilization, our culture, our morals uh, fundamentally good and worth preserving? Or is it, in the words of one of the great enemies of the American idea, Howard Zinn, a story of defeat, despair, domination, a tragedy in three acts, what we did to the Indians, what we did to the African Americans, and now what we've done to everyone else? Um, and that's a pretty fair description of his book, A People's History of the United States. With me to dig into this deconstructed get at the truth is Dr. Mary Graybar, who's a resident fellow of the Alexander Hamilton Institute of the Study for Western Civilization and the author of a book I highly recommend, Debunking Howard Zinn, Exposing the Fake History that Turned a Generation Against America. Also joining is Jared Stepman, a columnist for the Daily Signal, the multimedia publication of the Heritage Foundation, and the author of another book that I highly recommend, The War on History, The Conspiracy to Rewrite America's Past. Mary, Jarrett, welcome. Uh, well, Mary, we were joking before we came on. Howard Zinn, you know, some people, they talk about they're rolling in their graves because how badly things are going. Well, Howard Zinn may be, must be dancing in his grave. He's been about dead about 10 years, and his ideas are finally coming into the... Uh, mainstream, unfortunately. Tell, tell, tell us who Mary Howard, uh, Howard Zinn was and what he means for us now. And we'll dig a little feet. Keep going. Yeah. Well, Howard, the late Howard Zinn uh, was born in 1922. Uh, so he was a teenager. Uh, he grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, his parents were Jewish Russian immigrants. And in the 1930s, it was the heyday of communist recruitment. And so these older fellows would come into his neighborhood and recruit him, and he was a teenager. He participated in some of the mass marches they had, and uh, he worked in a shipyard after high school, and then he joined the service. He was a bombardier in World War II, and when he came back, he went uh, to college on the GI Bill, uh, eventually obtained his PhD from Columbia University, and he also became a member of the Communist Party. So he was an official member. Uh, he always denied it, but according to the best evidence we have, the interpretation of his over 400-page FBI file by Ron Radish, who himself was a uh, former member of the Communist Party, Howard Zinn was a member of the Communist Party. In 1956, he was interviewed for a position at Spelman College, which was a small uh, Christian college for black women in Atlanta. And uh, he got that job in 1956, and he moved to Atlanta and taught there for seven years. Now, he dropped his official membership, as many Communist Party members did, uh, because he wanted to infiltrate 
the institutions, uh, you know, per the orders of the Communist Party honchos. And he was there for seven years, and he was summarily fired by the first black and the first male president of that college for insubordination because he was radicalizing the students. So under the pretext of fighting for civil rights, he led them into dangerous protests. He also had them rebelling against the administration, telling them that they didn't need to follow curfews, that they shouldn't follow the dress code, that uh, attendance at chapel was a, you know, uh, just a meaningless ritual. And so he was fired with a year's salary. Uh, he fought that, and I go into that in my book. There are these questions <laughs> of a morals charge against, against Howardson regarding one of his students. But he landed at Boston University, where he taught until he retired in 1988. And he really did not teach, as you can imagine. He radicalized students. And at Boston University, he led students on anti-Vietnam War protests, uh, basically handed out AIDS uh, like candy and uh, you know had students go to prisons and interview prisoners you know to write reports about how the system is unjust and we should abolish prisons and police and so forth uh, he died in 2010 uh, worked up to the last minute uh, was featured by his uh, next door neighbor uh, matt damon who grew up next to him uh, in goodwill hunting his book took off uh, it started off slowly, but with pop cultural references, it gained in popularity. And as schools became increasingly radicalized, teachers felt freer to use it. I used to go to these teachers' conferences where yeah, they would talk yeah. about sneaking in pages. So, Jared, uh, Jared you, you, I'm going to give Jared a chance to. Jared, you, okay. you, you used Howard, Howard as a. Uh, as a source for your book and some of the other people, what, what's your, why has he become so, why are we talking about Howard Zinn? Well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, Howard Zinn, I think, started to move its way into our education system. Obviously, the book came out in 1980, but I think it, it kind of, as Mary said, it started slowly seeping into our system at the higher education level, but also at the high school level in America's schools. And I think there were a lot of teachers who, themselves were perhaps radicals and introduced a lot of his teachings into their classrooms. I mean, you can look today, go on amazon.com and a people's history of the United States is always a top bestseller. This is used in classrooms around the country. And I think for, for many young Americans, if they get any kind of instruction in history at all, it often comes uh, from Howard Zinn or something akin to Howard Zinn. I think you've seen a, a severe decline in civics knowledge, civics knowledge in this country. I mean, you can look at every poll, uh, you can see a steep decline from the older generations to the younger ones. The actual civic knowledge has declined rather precipitously, while at the same time, whatever contact young people get with history is often the teachings of Howard's in or a derivative of it. And I think that for millennials, my generation and Gen Z, they've been left without a lot of the traditional teachings about our history of the past and are left with nothing but sin. And that's their, their, their go-to. That's, that's now the baseline. As, whereas at one time, the teachings of Zinn were seen as uh, a radical outsider. I mean, his works were, uh, I think, debunked by even many liberal historians in his own day, and certainly now. Um, but those are the teachings that really took off, especially among a lot of mainstream Americans. And I think his ideas are becoming mainstream, whereas at one time, they were seen as incredibly radical. So what is the what what's what what makes it compelling? I mean, how how did how did how did it, how did it, how did it happen that everybody said we'll forget uh, the Constitution, forget uh, the founding of America? You know, we've got the 1619 project that the New York Times has launched, which says the founding of America started when 20 slaves showed up on the on the shores of Virginia, um, and not at not at 1776. How how big? And deep is this movement? Well, I think it's interesting that the 1619 Project, which to a certain extent is a derivative of what Zinn worked on, is more of a capstone than something new. I mean, obviously, that the arguments that are put forth in 1619 
you know, run very similarly to, to what Howard Zinn was saying, that America is, is based on something rotten, which you've been taught as a young person that America is good and great, is completely wrong. Uh, the 1776 is not our true founding. It's 1619. It's all these, these terrible things like slavery and, and tyranny and all these awful things. I think it's a compelling narrative, especially those who I think have a kind of, I would say, utopian view of human nature, of, 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 of possibility. And I think that that narrative that America was fundamentally broken and flawed, that the past is, is ugly, full of imperfections, uh, works its way very, very well for especially young people who think that they can uh, create this whole new world, this kind of perfect world where the sins of the past are washed away. And Zinn is kind of that perfect message. Yeah. I mean, he, he goes right out and lays out the case against uh, traditional American culture, traditional American institutions, uh, Western civilization itself. And, you know, obviously leading Americans toward a new path, you know, what that new path is, obviously, given his Marxist and socialist connections. I mean, it doesn't take long to to guess at what that new path is. But I think that's really uh, how it's taken off. It's because to a certain extent, I think there has been a lack well, of education about uh, traditional American ideas. I mean, I, you know, I talk about yeah. you know, the civics knowledge decline. I think this was just just ready to be opened up for the teachings of somebody like Sin, who now has a cult-like following. Well, Mary, you've written, uh, you mentioned utopian, Jared. You, you say written says basically presents anything that isn't immediately utopian as a result of uh, hypocrisy and greed and so it, we're appealing to the youthful idealism and if it's not perfect it's it's uh, there's some there's some bad people out there that are responsible for it uh, you both have written uh, and we've got, we're in the midst of seeing all these tach statues torn down you've both have written at length and interestingly about Christopher Columbus this started with, uh, the, how did this start? He became the, the central f historical figure that they had to deconstruct, and and then we've moved through history to others. Mary? Well, uh, Howard Zinn actually says that the United States has no right to exist, that it's a pretense. And uh, he started this trend of start of starting off US history textbooks with Columbus. That didn't used to be the case. So if you can go way, way back to the arrival of the first European, uh, you can show that this country is rotten uh, to its core. Um, so that has been his message. Um, what I did in uh, the analyzing his chapter on uh, Christopher Columbus was I went back to his sources and I he claims that he read the, the you know, logs and that he read Bartolome de las Casas, the, the priest who wrote about this, uh, but he actually didn't. He plagiarized the first five and a half pages of his, the, you know, famous opening pages of his book from uh, Buddy, who was a Marxist and a novelist and an anti-Vietnam war protester, Hans Koning. And it was a book that was written for high school students. It's about 100 pages long. And uh, so it's plagiarized from that. And that in itself is not a reputable book. It's a, it's a polemic. Um, so, so right from the get-go, you have uh, you know, the origins of uh, the United States uh, you know, based on false information but it's done in order to present the United States as rotten from its origins. And I might want to add that William Z. Foster, whose book bears uh, many similarities to Howard Zinn's, which was written in 1950 or 51. Now, Foster was the CPUSA uh, chairman, and he starts with Columbus and the discovery of America. So Zinn takes his cue, I think, from him. But it's not, it's, it, I think you're making it a very important point. It's not like just in the last couple of decades, new scholarship has uncovered startling facts about the founding of America or the discovery of America, and somehow it's, it's now, there's a, there's, a new, there's a new set of facts in history to combat with what we'd already thought. This was made up pretty much out of whole cloth based on a pre-existing uh, bias against America. 
and its ideals by somebody who was a communist and an SDS guy in the 60s. Jared? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Actually, it even goes even farther back. I mean, Engels actually uh, wrote quite a bit about Columbus. He blamed Columbus for Engels as, Engels as in Marx and Engels. Marx and Engels. Okay. Uh, it was and, a... Because he saw it as opening up a kind of global system of capitalism. And I think to a certain extent, Zen and others took cues uh, from those early Marxist writings. I mean, that's what Columbus has come to symbolize. It's interesting. They, they do so much to demonize the man Columbus, but I think it really is about something larger. It's about what Columbus brought to the world and how he transformed the world is which, what they blame for all the, the world's current ills. I mean, I think that's where, why they really started with Columbus and they need to demonize him and they need to make everything that he did uh, seem like something wicked, something that we should all revolt against. And it, I, I think Mary's right. It really was questioning the very existence of the United States of America. Uh, from its very beginning, and that's why it needed to start, and that's why the attacks are so uh, ferocious against Co Columbus, because to a certain extent, it doesn't really make sense. I mean, this is a figure that actually predates the United States very much, but they see that as the seed for what is the new world for the United States and, you know, everything that's come thereafter. You're watching The Bill Walton Show, and I'm here with Mary Graybar and Jarrett Stepman, and we're talking about uh, American history is rewritten by Howard Zinn, and we're now talking about Christopher Columbus. The thing I think is, I don't know if amusing is the right word, but you know, there weren't any statues of Columbus until the Italians began immigrating to America, and they showed up, what, 1890, 1900, 1910, 1920, and the politicians in New York and everyone else, in order to make the Italians feel uh, patriotic about their new country and maybe to get some votes, started putting up these, uh, these, uh, these statues of Columbus really mainly to, to, to celebrate Italian-Americans. And so we had a hyphenated group that, uh, uh, that was initially part of the, uh, the underclass and now is presumably part of the elite and, and the oppressor class. And, and so uh, it wasn't exactly like... Uh, this has been around forever. This is just in the last last century. Mary? Oh, well, you know, Washington Irving wrote that famous biography of Christopher Columbus. And uh, he was, uh, in, I, I think he was, before he uh, was an Italian-American, I think he was uh, celebrated as an American. Uh, the discovery of America was celebrated in sermons and uh, I think it was Franklin Roosevelt, uh, I'm pretty sure, made it into a national holiday. And I think around 1892, there were 11 Italians who were lynched. It's the largest uh, lynching in American history, called, you know, group lynching, uh, on suspicions of having uh, murdered someone. So, um, you know, they, they were persecuted. Uh, Italians were not thought of as, you know, being white at one time. And uh, there were notices sent out to not hire them on government construction sites. Uh, so I think it's a combination. I think there always was pride in the fact that, you know, Christopher Columbus had discovered America. But there was an added impetus, I believe, with the persecution of the Italian immigrants. Well, he writes, you know, Zen writes, everybody in his, in his crew is writing about how Columbus and the uh, Europe, European civilization, when they showed up at the shores of North, I don't know what we called it then, it wasn't North America, uh, you know, they were the serpent that destroyed a Garden of Eden. And he writes about, I think, Mary, you've written here that... Uh, he writes basically at a second grade level where he talks about happy topics like sharing, farming, hunting, and, and fishing. And so this was this uh, Rousseau pristine uh, Garden of Eden that uh, uh, the evil white people from, uh, from uh, North, North Europe, Europe uh, ruined. Jared? Yeah, I mean, it's, the, it's those kind of simplistic narratives. And I mean, to me, it, it seems rather amusing, especially, you know, studying, you know, history beyond, you know, just a book that, you know, from Howard Zinn. Uh, but to a lot of people, this kind of, this kind of clarity makes a lot of sense. I think it, it, it preys upon a misunderstanding of, of human nature, a misunderstanding of the, the larger world history. I mean, it, it, some of those narratives about this, you know, this kind of pacifist seal being broken by Christopher Columbus are, 
you know, downright laughable to a certain extent, but that's that's part of his message. Uh, and, and I think that's a, it's a very powerful one, especially, again, to people who don't have a larger education in the kind of deeper parts of history. Look, to the, to the radicals, to the communists, you know, they know some of this and they're willing to construct narratives uh, to suit their purposes. But for a lot of the faithful, a lot of the followers, uh, these, these stories, they, they make perfect sense. Uh, and they're, they're part of this kind of, you know, cult-like status of this, this movement. And unfortunately, a lot of young Americans have bought into it. I think, again, I, I stress because they don't have a deeper understanding often of human nature uh, or of larger history, of the history of humankind, which is full of, of violence and tyranny, bloodshed, I mean, oppression. I mean, new world and the old world, uh, much of the world was the same in that sense. So this idea that Christopher Columbus showed up here in the Americas uh, that were just this wonderful place of harmony and peace. There was no slavery and violence. And suddenly this, this horrible Hitler of the 1490s shows up and commits genocides and is, is almost a demonic character. I mean, it's almost laughable to a certain extent. But again, many have bought into this narrative uh, where I think if you ask, unfortunately, your average school-age child uh, in America right now, what they think of Columbus, uh, they'll have a lot of bad things to say about him. Uh, they won't know much else about him, but they'll know he's a villain. Well, and the, the, the romanization of the Aztec culture, uh, there, there's a terrific book, and I can't remember the author's name, it's called Constant Battles. He was an architect, or an architect, he was an anthropologist, uh, archaeologist, uh, and studied uh, ancient cultures all over the world in every continent and found evidence of warfare in every single one of them. And not only some warfare, but a lot. In some cases, he estimated that as many as 25% of the men in these cultures uh, died from uh, wounds or battle, things like that. So there's, so there's this mythology of, of, of happy state of nature. I guess Rousseau helped, helped bring that idea about. Mary? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that is the human condition, and I think behind this desire uh, to, uh, you know, see uh, American history as sort of this Manichaean battle is this faith that we can bring about utopia, uh, we can bring about paradise, that we can return, you know, to this pristine um, kind of culture where people share, there is no greed, there is no murder, all sin is abolished. Um, and I, I think the willingness to accept that kind of narrative comes from other things that we aren't teaching in school. So back when I was still allowed to teach, I was teaching at Emory, and I remember mentioning Adam and Eve, and this is Emory University, this is not your community college. And several of the students did not know who Adam and Eve were. So I, I, I'm serious, this was around 2012 or 2013. So we're, there is no base of knowledge from which to you know, pick up Howard Zinn's book and say, wait a minute, you know, as, as I think we, you had mentioned to me once, you pick it up and you're, you're disgusted with it. You know, you say, this is nonsense. This is, you know, nasty. It's a bunch of lies. Um, and, and they don't, they don't have that sense anymore. And they're not introduced. Well, to well that's why you, narratives. that's why you've given us such a public service. I guess my view is, thank you, Mary. You've read Howard's <laughs> book and written about it very lucidly. So we don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it's really hard. It's really hard to get get through it. Did you read all the way through it, uh, Jared? Could you stand it? <laughs> I, I have. I've, I've I've read most of it a few times over my life, <laughs> okay. uh, and I I I do think that's that's a, that's a great point, Mary. Especially, I mean, we just had a United States Senator Tim Kaine from Virginia say basically that the that the United States invented slavery. That essentially we created slavery, which is laughable if anybody's read the book of Exodus, uh, but frankly laughable if you've studied, you know, human history, period, it, that the idea that the United States created slavery, but this is said, something that was said in the Senate, and again, you know, who, who knows if the leaders of these things are really, do know the truth, and they just assume that the followers don't, uh, but I think you have that real problem, is that there, there are a lot of young Americans, and really young Westerners in general, who don't have a clear grasp of history. I mean, they don't have 
deep civics knowledge, a lot of these kind of firewalls that were in place for, for previous generations for a lot of kooky or crackpot ideas, they just don't exist anymore. You know, that kind of informed patriotism that uh, Ronald Reagan spoke about in his farewell address, you know, we, we haven't really had that. In a lot of our schools across this country, we haven't done a good job of teaching about American history so that, you know, young people will have a critical eye when they're told that Christopher Columbus was a monster, that the founders were no good. Uh, and I think that's become a real crisis in this country. I mean, I think that's, that's to a certain extent, some of the, you know, the locus of our crisis is that failure of civics. Let's, let's spend forward in history to the founding, 1776, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. The, the notion that somehow this is a new history, that we were terrible, means they haven't read real history. And real history recognizes that people are wildly imperfect. There's some good people. There's some bad people. It's always a struggle to make things better, to build a civilization. And the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, but the Constitution really is built on a very pragmatic, realistic understanding of, of, of people's darker nature as well as their, their better nature, better angels, if you will. And that's what makes that document so great is it keeps... It keeps any one group from accumulating power to, to wield power over others. Mary? Uh, yes, well, and, uh, you know, going back. You can't to top that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he what, he what he does is he operates from Marxist premises, yeah. and he says, uh, you know, well, how could there be equality when some people had more wealth than others? And so he... He tosses out these uh, loaded questions, and so uh, he makes uh, typically adolescent readers or very naive, uninformed readers think that they're smart by, uh, you know, presenting questions, questions in a row, and, uh, you know, like a good propagandist, he makes the reader believe that he has come up with the answers all on his own, and he's achieved, you know, arrived at this brilliant insight. So. Uh, you know, when, you know, so, so what Zinn is promoting is this mob democracy, which is what we're seeing now, which is exactly what the founders were afraid of. And um, so he constantly refers to the fact that there are these checks and balances. And, hey, why do you think that is? Is it because they really were afraid of reform and the oppressed masses rising up and you know the, the people who are rioting and rising up are the real heroes in his book jared yeah i i it's interesting to me i mean you talk about the founding and, and what that started the bedrock and i think you know there's this old saying that martin luther king jr actually used this quote you know the arc of history bends towards justice well, I think it seems that way to a large extent in the United States because we've had a system and a culture that allows us to correct wrongs, that allows us uh, to develop ourselves in a way that leads not to tyranny, which was where most revolutions end up, to, but to greater liberty and things like this. And I think our history has borne that out. Even where we do have flaws, we've been able to correct them through a constitutional system, a system of a uh, limitation on government, defense of private property, all these things, which have created you know, more prosperity for more people. It's why the United States has had, you know, phenomenal and incredible growth over the past two centuries. And it makes me think too, I mean, you know, look at one of our sister republics. I mean, look at, uh, when we look south in the Caribbean at the, the history of Haiti, which was actually the second republic created a new world. You know, their, their revolution was very violent. They committed a genocide toward the white planters that happened there. Uh, the, their first, you know, sort of president became, uh, made himself dictator for life and with the ability to appoint successors. And, you know, the, the country has a long, sad history following that of, of mostly revolution, violence, oppression, dictatorship, uh, and, and hopelessness. And where the United States was, was founded on something very different, something that was, had a bedrock that would produce results and prosperity for generations of people, many of whom have no ancestry with the original founding, but have inherited that system, have inherited that culture from them. And it's created something truly precious here in the United States. And I think that's what's entirely lost in Howard Zinn's narrative, where everything, every wow. sin is just because of the inherent wickedness of the United States. I think the real attitude should be quite the opposite, that 
you know, wickedness and violence and tyranny are, are the norm, uh, whereas the, 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 the liberty that we have here and the, the good things that we have here have been the exception. I mean, America has been an exceptional nation and has done incredible things in the really barely over two centuries of its existence. Uh, you know, where we've come in that time is, is one of the miracles of human history, uh, completely lost, of course, in Zinn's narrative. Well, uh, and they've also, using the, the Marx trope, which is that capitalism caused racism, and racism didn't exist before the capitalist system. And of course, Marx was the one who coined the term capitalism because free markets and and voluntary exchange didn't work very well with his rhetoric, so he began demonizing it right out of the box. Uh, where do we go from here? What do you, I mean, we've, we've sort of painted this bleak picture. I, I think there are a lot of stories we could tell about st statues being torn down. How do you see this, how do you see this evolving? How does this, how does this, uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the last act of this play? Uh, well, I mean, to me, I first of all, I I do ultimately believe, as you know, Lincoln once said that that right makes might, and I think that you know, at this moment, especially as we see American history coming under question, we've seen riots, we've seen a breakdown of the rule of law. I think the moment cries out for for leadership for those who still believe in what this country stands for, those who are willing to stand for 1776. I know it's a crazy thing that we even have to say that in modern America. But I do believe that leadership and showing uh, some backbone against the rioters and those who want to tear down American history and civilization will do a lot of good in rallying Americans who still believe in that system uh, and, and rallying them to the cause. We need articulate defenders of what this country has done, where it's where it is going. And, and I think that's do you, incredible. Do you, do you think do you think that the you know the, the the cities where these riots are happening and where the statues are being torn down for the most part are run by Democrats? been run by Democrats for decades. Uh, they obviously don't want to see Donald Trump reelected. Do you, I, I think that maybe they're just letting this thing run be, in order to make him look as bad as possible so they can win in November. Well, I think they also more, more or less agree with the protesters and they're, they're willing to concede to them whatever they want. I mean, I think it's, I think it's deeply shameful to see cities stand by as history is being destroyed, statues are being destroyed. In some cases, even people are being a, a violently attacked. I mean, we had a congressman uh, in Wisconsin who was violently attacked by a mob where basically the authorities just stand by or very hurriedly go and take down the statues in the dead of night, sometimes against the law uh, themselves. And I, I think that that you know, definitely shows, first of all, their sympathy with, with the protesters and the riots, uh, a total disregard for the rule of law in this country and you know those cities are going to pay a price. And there's going to be a long-term price to this breakdown. If you think you can control a mob and channel it uh, for for your political ends, yeah, maybe anarchists and communists like that. But if for those who want a system of future prosperity and success, uh, that is not the formula. And I think a lot of our big cities that are allowing this to happen and have not shown leadership, they're going to suffer not just this year or next year, but ten years from now because of these decisions. Well, you know, I, I I'm really worried. I think it's so much easier to destroy than to create. Uh, you're watching the Bill Walton show. I'm here with Mary Graybar and Jared Stepman, and we're talking about the uh, what's happening in our cities today and the the movements to tear down statues and um, what people think they're going to replace American civilization with. Mary, your thoughts? Well. <laughs> I obviously want people to buy my book, and um, so do I. And Jared, yeah. I want them to buy. It. Let's plug your book right again. <laughs> it's, well, it's, well, one of the things I, I, I think. No, let, let's do it again. Uh, it's it's the uh, debunking Howard Zinn, exposing the fake history that turned a generation against America. We find that on Amazon. Yes, and Jared, your book is the war on history, the conspiracy to rewrite America's past. And the thing, we haven't talked as much about your book, Jared, but the thing's very interesting is the, is the biographies you give of, these, uh, of all these Americans, including Andrew Jackson, uh, who's also in the list of, uh, of uh, bad guys, according to this group. Mary, continue. I'm sorry I interrupted you. Um, well, you know, for decades, you know, 40 years now, people have been complaining about Howard Zinn. Um, and I, I went to this conference and there were a bunch of professors around and I held up my book as we were making introductions and they applauded 
because someone had gotten down into the muck and the mud and gone through Howardson's pages. And what I found is that he's not only biased, but he leaves out critical facts. The way he quotes is he leaves off critical words and so he changes the meanings. Uh, he even uses David Irving, a Holocaust denier, as one of his sources for his chapter on World War II. So the way to get his book out of the classroom, which is, which I think is critical, is to get it out on the basis of it being faulty history. The counter argument always is, well, you know, you uh, are overlooking, you know, the, the people, the regular people. This is a corrective to this triumphalist history that's been taught in our schools. Um, you know, that's their argument. But would we use a book by David Irving in the classroom, uh, which is written uh, in a sympathetic vein to the Nazis? Yeah. Would we use that in our classroom? Let me do Same my thing for Howard Zinn. Uh, we would not use a book that denies that slavery was horrible and unjust. We would not use a book that, you know, kind of glosses that over. Similarly, we should not use a book that is as false. Let, factually let, false. let, let me do my first negative plug ever. Do not buy. Do not buy this book. <laughs> this is a horrible book. It's filled with lies and it's poisoning your children's minds. What you ought to do is you read ought to be Mary and uh, and Jarrett's books, which tells you the truth, but also gets into how this book distorts history and why it's such an evil force in America today. So I had to buy it. You don't have to. So anyway, that's my negative plug. <laughs> uh, World War II. This is another one that's been, I, 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 was, I, did, I, I was not current with this. Apparently we're now teaching that America was just as bad as the Nazis in World War II. Jarrett? Yeah, or it, I think another narrative that's now cropping up is that it's really the, the, the USSR that won World War II. The United States didn't win the war. It's becoming like almost like, you know, one of those gotcha, you know, hipster kind of things. Well, as you know, actually the USSR won, won World War II, which of course, if you know the nature of the USSR, if the USSR really did win World War II, it would not be a victory for free, free people in this world. I mean, that's that's the reality. And the, the reality is we had to face a long twilight struggle, in the, in the words of, of, of Kennedy, uh, with that Soviet Union that was based on yet another evil system uh, that was not one based on freedom uh, that, that we have. Uh, and so I think this this kind of idea, and unfortunately, again, it goes to the lack of information. I think a lot of Americans still believe that, that World War II was as the good war that America was was on the right side. But I think a lot yeah. of the the details about that are being lost. And whereas, you know, the only thing that I think a lot of young Americans get is that the United States uh, interned uh, Japanese Americans. I mean, that's, that's literally the only thing they know we won, yeah. maybe. Uh, but and we also had concentration camps like like the Nazis, which is, uh, I, I think, well, really a malignant narrative about the war. And it, it loses the larger context of what we were fighting uh, and what this country went through at that time. And I think it's again, it goes to that lack of information, a generation of young Americans who just don't know much except for a few little things. And they hear, oh, well, America did terrible things, too, so we must have been just as bad. Well, and anybody who reads, reads that history knows the history of the Eastern Front in Germany when the Soviets came in. They outdid the Nazis in genocide and, and, and murdering millions of people as they marched into, uh, uh, marched into Germany. And uh, had the United States and the, and the Allies been there, they would have kept going. Yeah, I think there's no doubt that they would have kept going. There were a lot of contingency plans for... Russian tanks to storm through the rest of the tattered remains of Western Europe. I mean, it was the United States, the strength of the United States and Great Britain that ultimately prevented that, and primarily the United States, I mean, at that point. I mean, the, the U.S. was at that point now the preeminent superpower, you know, really holding the torch for liberty and did so for a very long time thereafter, uh, whereas, you know, the Soviet Union had aggressive, you know, they, they talk about the United States as imperialist. Well, they were very much uh, imperialists and wanted to spread uh, their their political systems around the globe, which they did violently. 
um, you know, that, you know, that was the history of the Cold War. Unfortunately, millennials, you know, for, for the most part were born as that Cold War was coming to a close, the Berlin Wall was coming down. They've lost some understanding of what that larger debate was between the Soviet Union and the United States. They no longer really know the differences, uh, I think, sometimes be in the distinctions between what the USSR was based on, what we were based on. So I think you have a whole generation that has been removed from, I think, an understanding that older ones had uh, about the differences. And so, you know, you have revisionist histories now. I mean, the, the, the New York Times running things, praising the, the revolution of 1917, having this, I think, really uh, disgusting praise of, of Lenin and all these different figures, uh, really, I mean, at one time probably would have been, would have gotten a lot more anger. I think these days, it's just, well, you know, I guess, I guess uh, the USSR wasn't so bad after all, which is a, a disgusting idea. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful we can get a lot of these ideas dislodged. I, I worry. I, I see the college board has is, is, is put uh, Howard Zinn's book in the advanced placement U.S. history curriculum. So if you want to do well in the, on that test, that you've got to regurgitate uh, uh, these lies. Uh, how, how did this lead up to cancel culture? Uh, you know, I think a large part of cancel culture is shutting down those who say something different or have a, a alternative points of view. I think that for a lot of these these people, they, they don't want there to be any contradiction to their narratives. I mean, their truth replaces the truth. Uh, and I think that that is a big part of this. They don't like the idea. I mean, you know, these debates over history and the complexities with it, they don't like that. They want you just simply to buy their message and their narrative. I think truth, unfortunately, uh, very fortunately, I just think destroys a lot of their their, their narratives and their ideas. But uh, you know, they're trying to create a culture uh, that now can simply shut down those who who disagree. And I think that that very much plays into this whole thing. I think that's part of the reason why you know they go after statues, they go after people, they need to silence uh, any kind of opposition. This is the this this is politics of pure power. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. You don't try to win through uh, debate and argument and reason. Uh, you try to win through simply, you know, using might to crush your enemies. And I think that's really what this comes down to. Mary? Yeah, I agree. It's, it's all about power. And, uh, you know, I 